This CD contains a series of radio shows presented by Pastor Sheldon Emery. These programs were broadcast many years ago, so when you hear Pastor Emery mention books or packages available by mail, please understand that some of that material may no longer be available, and if you hear him give out a mailing address, it is incorrect. For a current catalog of literature and electronic media offered by America's Promise Ministries, please visit our website, where you will also find links to Pastor Dave Barley's YouTube video sermons and many other valuable resources. We invite you to explore www.amprom.org. That's A-M-P-R-O-M dot O-R-G. Thank you. God willing, we are going to talk about economics. The world and God. We'll be reading God's laws on money, on debt, on interest, on gold and silver, and so on. And we'll see how our disobedience to the divine law has brought and is bringing great calamities upon our people and upon our nation. Some of you folks in the Midwest and northeastern parts of the United States are suffering through the worst cold spell in the history of the United States. Most of you probably never thought this had anything to do with God's laws. But if you will stay tuned to this preacher during the next several weeks, God willing, I believe I can show you that even the weather disruption is prophesied in the Word of God. Before we go to the Bible, though, I will tell you the probable immediate source of this calamity. You dear people who are out of work, or whose businesses have been closed down, or whose property has been damaged by this terrible cold, you may never have known it, but for about 20 years, some people in America have been trying to warn us that the Red Communist government in Russia was conducting experiments on how to cause great masses of freezing Arctic air to move south over the North American continent. This is called climate or weather warfare. It is my opinion from information I have gathered on this over the last 20 years that America is right now under a weather warfare attack from red communist Russia. The United States government itself has conducted weather control experiments over the continent for over 20 years. It was government cloud seeding which brought on the disastrous flood in Redwood Falls, South Dakota, several years ago. Cloud seeding over Utah and Colorado in 1973 drenched that area with rain and snow and brought drought to the Texas Panhandle, Oklahoma, and the Plains areas. The congressional record carried extensive exposures of the use of weather control by our military in South Vietnam by causing excess rainfall in Laos and Cambodia to try to shut off the so-called Ho Chi Minh Trail from North Vietnam. For over 20 years, United States Air Force planes have been flying so-called hurricane watch flights over the Atlantic and have conducted experiments in seeding silver iodide into hurricanes to disrupt them or to change their direction. In the last few years, about 10 years to be exact, a cloak of silence has been placed over all such operations, and you no longer read of them in the public press, but they are still continuing. I do not plan to cover all of the scientific findings on such things, as I do want to spend most of the next broadcast on God's economic laws, but in just a moment I will give you the scientific principle I believe the Reds are using which is bringing these massive intrusions of Arctic air into Canada and the United States. It is not complicated. It is scientifically feasible and physically possible using currently known methods of weather modification. If you have a friend who would be interested in whether this is a Russian weather attack on America, and especially if you have an acquaintance who knows something about weather or weather control, Call him up and tell him to listen to this broadcast to see if this makes sense. I'll offer our February free literature packet first, and then I will tell how Russia could conceivably be causing the weather disaster 
which has come upon central and eastern United States, and then we'll turn to God's laws in the Bible. My address is America's Promise, Box 5334, Phoenix, Arizona, 85010. And since we are going to be reading God's laws on economics this month, I am going to offer the same packet for February I offered in January. If you have already written for the January packet, you either have it or it is on the way. If not, write to me now and ask for the February packet, and I will send you my booklet, Billions for the Bankers Brings War, Taxes, and Debt to the People. I am not selling this pamphlet. It is free for the asking, and it describes to you very simply and clearly just how the moneylenders in America are surely taking debt title to the nation. A few days ago, our local newspaper revealed the assessed value of all land and improvements in America, now on the tax rolls, is about $1 trillion. But what they did not reveal was that we American citizens owe the moneylenders the equivalent of three trillions of dollars, yes, three trillions of dollars, that is federal, state, local, and private debts, on which we are paying them interest, and through which they foreclose and take actual title on several tens of billions of dollars of other people's property every year. God said to our forefathers in Israel that if they disobeyed his laws, quote, the stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high, and thou shalt come down very low. He shall lend to thee, let me repeat that, he shall lend to thee, and thou shalt not lend to him, he shall be the head, and thou shalt be the tail. Deuteronomy 28, verses 43 and 44. In other words, one of the curses of God's law was for his people to be in debt to the stranger that is within thee. Any casual reading of the information about the men appointed by recent presidents to rule over the government bureaucracy will reveal that many, many of these men are alien-born, not born in the United States, but in Russia, in Poland, in Austria, in Germany, and so on. The stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high. Investigation by various committees of Congress has revealed that the eastern banks, which hold most of the multi-billion dollar mortgages on the government, on industry, and on Americans, are owned by Europeans and Asians, not by Native Americans. Prophecy has come to pass. You should read, My Billions for the Bankers Brings War, Taxes, and Debts to the People. The February packet will include some other things, and I repeat, it is the same literature we sent out in January. Please don't write for the February packet if you have already gotten the January packet, unless you want the articles to give to a friend or a relative. My address again, America's Promise, Box 5334, Phoenix, Arizona, 85010. Ask for the February free literature packet. All right, in a minute we will turn to the Bible and read some of God's laws on money, but first, that scientific principle which the Reds may be using to devastate America and Canada with freezing Arctic air. Most of you folks know how a top spins. You've either played with a top when a youngster or you've seen children do it. Do you remember how a top could be standing in one place, spinning at high speed, or possibly slowly moving across the table or the sidewalk, and if someone touched it with a finger or a toe, it would spurt sideways while it still continued to spin? Well, our atmosphere moves across the face of the earth in great spinning masses of air revolving around either high or low pressure areas. You've seen this on your television weather news as the reporter draws arrows showing how the cold air is being brought south by air movement around a high pressure area or warm air is being brought north by the same means. This is common. 
It is nothing out of the ordinary. It is how we get gradual changes in weather all year long, and it is no secret. But in the last ten years, our own government, in its experiments in seeding hurricanes, which are nothing more nor less than faster-moving circles of air masses, discovered that massive cloud seeding at one point on the edge of a hurricane had the same effect on that spinning hurricane as the touch of a toe on a spinning top. It would cause it to veer off and radically change direction. About ten years ago, unrevealed to the American public, U.S. Air Force planes seeded the edge of a hurricane in the Atlantic east of Florida, and the hurricane turned directly west, crossed Florida at the 29th parallel, went west into the Gulf of Mexico, and turned north up the Mississippi Valley. It did extensive damage to Florida and other southeastern states, and brought floods and winds as far north as Minneapolis, Minnesota. The newspapers and television weathermen commented on its strange behavior, since hurricanes always travel from their origin in the Atlantic or the Caribbean in an arc, first slightly west of north, then north, then northeast into the Atlantic Ocean and dissipate as they reach the colder northern air. Their tracks are predictable. But this one had defied all known weather laws and from its northward path had turned suddenly west, resuming its natural northerly direction only after it had traveled almost 1,000 miles west, contrary to all previous recorded hurricanes. This same thing was repeated just a few years ago with a hurricane off the eastern seaboard, which again turned directly west, crossed into the United States over New Jersey and Maryland, and did extensive damage in those states, plus Pennsylvania, Ohio, New York, and adjoining areas. The U.S. Weather Bureau dutifully reported the hundreds of millions of dollars in damage, but apparently all mention of the U.S. weather planes is forbidden, and the American people have completely forgotten that ten years ago the government was experimenting on how to control or direct hurricanes. Now, this winter, massive, almost continent-sized cold air masses from beyond northern Canada are strangely changing their normal easterly path over Canada, Greenland, and the North Atlantic, and are veering south and coming into the United States over the Dakotas, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, and continuing on south and east, bringing disastrous freezes over one-third of the continental United States. The possible cause is the same. Massive silver iodide seeding by our communist enemy on the outer edge of a circling high-pressure area over Siberia and north of Alaska or Canada, touching the side of the spinning top, as it were, and causing it to dramatically shift its direction southward. Unbelievable? No, not at all. Remember, the Reds intend to destroy America, and they apparently have enough spies in America to learn everything our government knows about weather control. Just imagine the military advantage they would have if they could immobilize our northern and eastern cities before they launch their missiles in war. Well, that is all the time I shall take on that. We do pray God will have mercy, and we thank God for at least one governor who had the good sense to set aside a day of prayer for the people of his state to ask God's intervention. The whole deliverance of America from the red Antichrist Bolsheviks will, in the future, be tied up with our humbling ourselves in the face of enemy attack and praying to God for deliverance. God willing, we'll get into that on some of these broadcasts in the future. But now let us turn to the basic cause of our troubles, our disobedience to God's law. We are in violation in many areas, but for now we will discuss God's laws on money and economics. In the Bible following the Ten Commandments, God gave Moses several hundred commandments, statutes, and judgments, 
which make up God's laws for government and for the individuals. In Exodus 22, as God exhorted Israel about the personal relationship of people, he told them not to oppress any stranger or afflict any widow or fatherless child. Verse 21 and 22, and then he speaks on lending money. This is Exodus 22. If thou lend money to any of my people that is poor by thee, thou shalt not be to him as an usurer, neither shalt thou lay upon him usury. Verse 25. This is expanded in Leviticus 25, verses 35 through 37. And if thy brother be waxen poor, and fallen in decay with or by thee, then shalt thou relieve or help him, Yea, though he be a stranger or a sojourner, that he may live with thee. Take thou no usury of him, or increase, but fear thy God, that thy brother may live with thee. Thou shalt not give him thy money upon usury, nor lend him thy victuals for increase. In Deuteronomy 23, God says he will bless them if they do not charge usury. Verse 19 and 20. Thou shalt not lend upon usury to thy brother, usury of money, usury of victuals, usury of anything that is lent upon usury, unto a stranger, and that means an alien outside of the nation, unto a stranger thou mayest lend upon usury, but unto thy brother thou shalt not lend upon usury, that the Lord thy God may bless thee, in all that thou settest thine hand to in the land, whither thou goest to possess it. That is a plain statement from God Almighty, that it was necessary that his people refrain from charging interest on money, or else God could not bless them in their land. And by the way, the words usury and interest are interchangeable. The moneylenders and their cohorts in America including those in the church, have taught us for a hundred years that usury is high or excessive interest. No, usury is interest. Interest is usury. God's law forbids usury on money, period. Psalm 15 asks, Lord, who shall be in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Part of the answer he that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. Jeremiah declared his righteousness by saying he had never charged usury. Jeremiah 15 and verse 10. In Ezekiel 18, Ezekiel said that if a man did that which is lawful and right, he would not charge usury, verse 8, and declares of the usurer in verse 13, he shall not live... He hath done all these abominations, he shall surely die. Just imagine, in God's word, the death penalty for lending money at interest, yet today there is hardly a Christian church in the nation that condemns this taking of this unjust gain. God told Israel in old Canaan land that he would scatter them among the heathen and disperse thee in the countries and one of the reasons was this, Ezekiel 22, verses 12 through 15, In thee have they taken gifts to shed blood, in other words, bribery. Thou hast taken usury and increase, and thou hast greedily gained of thy neighbors by extortion, and hast forgotten me, saith the Lord God. That sounds like modern America. One of the most tragic errors taught from today's church pulpits is that these laws are no longer in effect. But Jesus Christ said in Matthew 5.17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. From this and other scripture passages, we know that Jesus came to, quote, put my laws into their mind, and write them in their heart. That's in Hebrews 8, verses 8 through 10. In Luke 6, Jesus specifically told his followers they were not to lend for reward or gain, but to be merciful. Luke 6, verse 34 through 36. And Jesus said, If ye love me, keep my commandments. In John 1 and verse 4, it is written, 
he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not my commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Martin Luther, the great light of the Reformation in Europe, and others of his day, taught no such nonsense that God's laws were not to be obeyed. Luther compared the taking of usury with theft and murder, as the Scripture does. From the time of the Reformation to within the last 100 years, many Christian denominations refused church membership to anyone who lent money at interest. Today, churches not only condone this ungodly evil, but practice it themselves. Our entire financial system is based on disobedience of these commandments of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our ministers tell us we need not obey those commandments, and the result has been debt bondage for our people and the threatened destruction to our nation. During England's several hundred years' march toward personal liberty, the lending of money at interest was declared illegal by the kings in the 10th century, Usurers had their land forfeited to the crown in the 11th century. In addition, the usurer was declared an outlaw and was banished from England. Up through the 15th century, the punishment for usurers varied from forfeiture of all property to the putting to death of lenders of money at interest. By the 18th century, the turning away from biblical law led to the establishment of interest as a legal claim, and by the 19th century, England passed into the control of the bankers. 800 years of upward struggle and thrust to personal liberty and to national prosperity has been all but destroyed in England in the last 100 years by bankers' wars, usury, and taxes. In England today, the living standard is dropping drastically, with a large percentage of the workers' earnings taken for the payment of interest to the bankers. America is following in England's footsteps, because we have disobeyed God's laws on interest. Our banker control over our government would collapse without their ungodly usury, yet American ministers are silent on this iniquity. I read this in Ezekiel 22. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof. Her priests have violated my law, and have profaned mine holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and profane, neither have they showed difference between unclean and the clean. They do not preach to the people the difference between right and wrong. It is common in modern America for ministers to praise our economic system even to urge people to be sure and pay their debts to the moneylenders. Many go so far as to preach that credit and interest on credit are responsible for our high standard of living. They even quote the words of Jesus Christ in Luke 19 and claim that Jesus approved of interest on money. I was not going to go into the New Testament so quickly in this study, but since I mentioned that, perhaps we should... And we will read that parable in Luke 19, and I will demonstrate to you that Jesus not only did not approve of interest or usury on money, he condemned it. Now you turn to that and you read that after I go off the air. That is Luke 19, verses 11 through verse 27, in what is commonly called the parable of the ten servants. This is the one where Jesus said to the one servant that he should have put his money with the bank and then he would have collected interest. Now you read that and then God willing next week I will demonstrate to you how that parable is taught by the preachers to mean the exact opposite of what it actually means. In verse 30 of Jeremiah 23 God says, Behold, I am against the prophet, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. And teaching God's word in error is what that is, stealing God's word from his people. Next week, God willing, we shall continue in God's word and God's law on money and economics. Be with me and have your Bible with you if you can. 
This is Pastor Emery saying goodbye. God bless you. Read your Bibles and pray for Christian America. God willing, we will continue today our Bible study of God's laws on economics, on money, on debt, interest, cancellation of debts, and so on. The results of our violation of God's laws in this area are outlined in my booklet, Billions for the Bankers. We will be reading the words of Jesus Christ to the wicked servant in Luke 19, where Jesus rebuked the servant and then said in verse 23, Wherefore then gavest not thou my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury? That remark by Jesus Christ is used in the modern church to teach that Jesus now approves of interest on money. But we shall study the whole passage to see just exactly what Jesus meant when he seemed to approve the violation of God's law, which in the Old Testament says, Thou shalt not lend upon usury to thy brother. That is in Deuteronomy 23, verse 19. And, of course, usury on money or debts is forbidden in Exodus 22, in Leviticus 25, in Psalm 15, and by both Jeremiah and Ezekiel, as we saw last week. How does Jesus' statement fit in with God's law? Well, we'll explain that in a few minutes. While you are getting your Bibles to read that passage with me, and you should do that, last week I explained how the Red Communists had been experimenting for over 20 years on how to disrupt the normal movement of air across the earth in order to cause great masses of Arctic air to swing south into the United States, and that I believe they had perfected that weather control and that America was now suffering from a weather warfare attack from the Reds. I explained how they were doing it, and I won't take the time to repeat that, but I do want my listeners to know I am not ruling out God. Let me repeat that. In this massive freeze and cold, I am not ruling out God. In Psalm 147, we read of God... He giveth snow like wool, he scattereth the hoarfrost like ashes, he casteth forth his ice like morsels. Who can stand before his cold? Verse 16 and 17 of Psalm 147. Yes, it is God's snow, God's frost, and God's cold. At least one state, and perhaps more by the time you hear this broadcast, will have officially recognized that God Almighty is the master of the winds and of the snow by setting aside a day of prayer for relief from the storm. The Russians may have done the massive seeding of the clouds over Siberia with silver iodide, which caused the spinning masses of air to change course and come south, but if so, they were allowed to do so by God." As this preacher has said so many times on these radio broadcasts, and as many other Christians are coming to realize, the United States of America is under the judging hand of God for chastisement because of our refusal to obey His Word. The prophet Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 59, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Some of the next verses tell why God does not hear a people's prayers. Your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Verse 7. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Do you think one million innocent babies murdered in the womb last year with official government approval would defile a nation's hands with blood? I think it might. No, 
whether it is the Reds as the immediate cause of our devastating weather, the ultimate cause is our own sin and iniquity as a nation of God's people. God help us. Although we have been blessed by God above all other people, we deny Him in a thousand ways. We refuse to allow His Bible to be read to our children. We make it illegal for people to pray to God in public places. Our ministers preach lies, and we wonder why calamities are now coming upon us. Could God have something to do with that also? God told our fathers in Israel, through the prophet Amos, Amos 4, verse 7 and 8, I caused it to rain upon one city, and caused it not to rain upon another city. One piece was rained upon, and the piece whereupon it rained not withered. So two or three cities wandered unto one city to drink water. I'll quickly offer our free February literature, and then we'll turn to Luke 19 and Christ's words about interest on money, whether Jesus approved it or not. My address is America's Promise, Box 5334, Phoenix, Arizona, 85010. The February packet is a repeat of January's, because I want as many of you as possible to read my pamphlet, Billions for the Bankers Brings War, Taxes, and Debts to the People. It is a simply written article explaining how the collection of interest by the moneylenders transfers the wealth of the nation from the poor to the rich. It also saddles unpayable debt on future generations so that our children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren are already bound by debt chains so they will work many months out of each year to pay interest to the bankers on money we borrowed and spent years and generations before they were born. We are already doing that today. Some of your earnings are used to pay interest on federal and state debts dating back to the early 1900s. In some cases, we are paying interest on money which was borrowed to build government buildings or welfare housing which has already been torn down and destroyed. The buildings are gone, but the interest on the debt goes on and on to the moneylenders all in violation of God's divine law. Billions for the bankers will be sent to you when you write to me at America's Promise, Box 5334, Phoenix, Arizona, 85010. Ask for the free February packet. You'll receive several other tracts or articles, a catalog of Bible studies on cassette tapes, our radio log, and so on. And I'll repeat that address again later in the broadcast. Remember, the February packet is the same as the January packet. If you have written in January, please do not write again unless you want the material for a friend or a relative. And when you write, please print your name and address. Every month the post office returns a few of our radio packets marked undeliverable as addressed. Our mailroom staff could not read your name or address, guessed at it, guessed wrong, and it came back. That means we paid postage to send it, we paid again when it was returned, and you still did not get the literature. And you may probably be angry, thinking we did not send it. So, if you did not receive literature when you wrote and asked for it, write again, but print or type your name and address. Help us help you. All right, Luke 19, verses 12 through 27 are what is commonly called the parable of the ten servants. In verse 12, Jesus began, A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. Christians who are familiar with Jesus' parables know the nobleman here represents Jesus, of course, and he was referring to the fact that he would soon leave them 
and then would return later, his return being his second advent, which is yet to come. Anyway, in verse 13, he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds, or in effect, what was some money, and said unto them, Occupy till I come, or till I return. You know the rest of the story, how the nobleman returned and called each servant before him that, verse 15, he might know how much every man had gained by trading. And by the way, that word trading there should have been literally translated by working in his trade. It doesn't mean by being a middleman, buying and selling as some might think. You look up the meaning of that word in your Strong's Concordance, and you will see it means, in effect, gainful employment. The nobleman, or symbolically Jesus, called each man to account to see how much he had gained by honest work, as it were. Anyway, the first one had earned much and was commended, as was the second one. But then we come to the third servant, the one to whom Jesus spoke the words, which are mistaught to mean Jesus approves usury or interest. Read them with me, and you will see how deceptive some men can be who claim they are teaching the Word of God. Verse 20 of Luke 19. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, or thy money, here is thy pound which I have kept laid up in a napkin, for I feared thee, because thou art an austere man. And then he describes what he thought Jesus was. Because thou art an austere man, thou takest up that thou layest not down, and reapest that thou didst not sow. Jesus replies, verse 22 and 23, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest not thou my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury? And then the modern clergy has been taught in their seminaries to say, See, Jesus told this man he should have put his money in the bank and got an interest on it. So therefore, Jesus approves interest, and it is all right for the bankers to charge or pay interest, and so on and on. And they put Jesus on the side of the usurer. But let us see what Jesus Christ really said, what he really meant by his words. Remember in verse 20, the wicked servant said to him, I feared thee, because thou art an austere man. Thou takest up that thou layest not down, and reapest that thou didst not sow. What was the servant saying to Jesus? Well, he was saying to him, Jesus, I know that you take that which does not belong to you. I know you harvest where you have not sown. In other words, he was saying to Jesus, I know you are a thief. That is why Jesus then condemned him and said what he did. Jesus did not condemn the servant for what the servant did or did not do. Jesus condemned him for what he said. Listen to it again. Verse 22 of Luke 19. And he saith unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. In other words, for what you said I will punish you. And then he went on. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. In other words, you wicked servant, you thought I was a thief, taking property that did not belong to me, wherefore then gavest not thou my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own by thievery. That is the correct interpretation of Luke 19. 
Jesus was not condemning the man for not collecting usury from the bank. Jesus was condemning the man for saying Jesus was a thief. And Jesus said in sarcasm, or what is called in the Bible in an idiom, You thought I was a thief, therefore, why did not you collect interest on my money and steal for me? In plain truth, Jesus called usury stealing. No, Jesus Christ is not on the side of the usurer and the moneylender. Jesus does not approve of usury, and any minister who says that he does is a liar. Jesus drove the moneylenders out of the temple in old Jerusalem, and Jesus Christ will help us as his body drive the moneylenders out of his temple in America someday. May God speed the day. Well, I wanted to cover that at the beginning of our study on God's laws, because I know when I have had opportunity to speak or to lecture to individual Christians or to church groups, as soon as I state that God Almighty forbids the charging of interest on money, someone always comes up and says, Oh, but in the New Testament Jesus says interest is okay. It is no longer forbidden. And they then quote his words to that wicked servant in Luke 19. They are wrong. But who taught them how to quote the Bible to teach that usury was all right? Was it the banker and the moneylender? No, it was their minister. In Jeremiah 23, there is a whole chapter about pastors who destroy and scatter God's sheep. And in verse 30, God calls them prophets that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. You might have thought the ones who are stealing God's words from our people were those who have outlawed the Bible from the public schools. But the worst thieves of God's words are those who claim to teach it and then steal the true meaning from the people. God says of these same false prophets in verse 14, quote, They strengthen also the hands of the evildoers. And they do. With their lies about God's laws on economics and on usury, they strengthen the hand of the usurers and the moneylenders who are destroying and gobbling up America with their cursed debt usury upon our nation and upon our people. All right, back to God's economic laws in other areas. How about lending and debt? Turn with me to the 15th chapter of Deuteronomy, and we'll begin reading in verse 7. If there be among you a poor man of one of thy brethren within any of thy gates in thy land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not harden thine heart, nor shut thine hand from thy poor brother. But thou shalt open thine hand wide unto him, and shalt surely lend him sufficient for his need in that which he wanteth. So we are commanded to lend where there is actual need, but at the same time to prevent unpayable debts from accumulating and destroying the poor, God's law establishes a cycle of cancellation of debts every seven years. Deuteronomy 15, verses 1 through 4. At the end of every seven years thou shalt make a release. And this is the manner of the release. Every creditor that lendeth aught unto his neighbor shall release it. He shall not exact it of his neighbor or of his brother, because it is called the Lord's release. Of a foreigner thou mayest exact it again, and that's a person outside of the land. But that which is thine with thy brother thine hand shall release, save when or as the margin translation says, to the end that there shall be no poor among you, for the Lord shall greatly bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it. 
as we see here, this was not seven years after the loan was made, but these were seven-year national cycles, and all debts in the nation were canceled at the same time. That is why we read in verse 9, Beware that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of release, is at hand. Beware that you don't say, Well, I don't want to lend this poor devil anything, because it is only three months to the release, and I won't get it back. It will just be canceled. From the words of the next verse, we can see that only people who trust the everlasting God would obey such laws. Verse 10, Thou shalt surely give him, and thine heart shall not be grieved when thou givest unto him, because that for this thing the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thy works and in all that thou puttest thine hand unto. We would have to trust that God would take care of us and do what he said he would do. Today our people do not trust God, and instead they trust interests and the moneylenders and the government, and they are being robbed and plundered and killed and destroyed, just as God warned they would be when they would not put their trust in Him and obey His laws. Verse 6 says, For the Lord thy God blesseth thee as He promised thee, and thou shalt lend unto many nations, but thou shalt not borrow, and thou shalt reign over many nations, but they shall not reign over thee. This was true of America of the past. We lent to other nations, and we did not borrow. But now we are borrowing billions of dollars every year from alien moneylenders who operate our so-called banks. And we are now finding that these same alien moneylenders now reign over us. They control our government. They are taking control of our industry, even buying up or foreclosing on our farms. And we are rapidly becoming the tail and not the head. Does your preacher teach that God's laws have all been put away under the cross and are no longer applicable today? Well, you ask him, how come America is coming under all the curses that are written in the law if the law and its judgments were ended at the cross? Jesus Christ told us plainly in Matthew 5 and verse 17, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. You ask your preacher, if heaven and earth have passed away, and if not, why he teaches that the law has. Jesus went further. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Strange words from a God who supposedly intended to destroy that law a few months later with his death. No, Jesus did not destroy the law, but just as Paul writes in Romans 3.31, Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. Paul said, Faith establishes the law. And today we must also be taught that we will obey the law if we really believe and have faith in Jesus Christ. Yes, even nationally. When we as a nation turn to Jesus Christ, we will outlaw interest on money and cancel all debts. A startling statement? Yes, but one easily borne out in the law and in the prophets. And God willing, we shall get into that more in the coming weeks. Cancellation of all debts in America. Unbelievable? Not really. It is coming. How soon, I do not know. But it is prophesied in the Bible. Be with me next week if you can. 
We'll continue our study on the Bible and God's laws on money and economics. Until then, this is Pastor Emery saying goodbye. God bless you. Read your Bibles and pray for Christian America. God willing, we will continue today in our study of Bible economics, God's laws on money, on credit and debt, on interest or usury, cancellation of debts, and so on. Scores and more probably hundreds of books have been written in America in the last 50 years outlining the problems of America's debt money system, which robs the poor and gives to the rich. But the initial crime of debt money is the crime of usury, or the taking of interest on debt. The United States of America, by the late 1800s, had become the most productive nation on earth. Although we constituted at that time perhaps less than 5% of the world's population, more than 75% of new patents were being issued to American inventors, and the theory and practice of mass production of useful goods and necessities of life became literally an American monopoly until the 20th century. Since 1900, other nations have learned in part our inventions, technology, and agricultural practices, and have, except for communistic nations, increased their own standard of living by emulating American industry and agriculture. In that same 75 years, since the turn of the century, America has become the most debt-plagued nation on earth, and the church has no answer. Debt-free homes and farms were the rule. In America from 1650 to 1900, today they are the exception. In the early 1900s, shopkeepers, small businessmen, and skilled laborers lived in four- to eight-bedroom homes on which they had no mortgages. Their wives did not work, but stayed home and raised anywhere from three to a dozen children, and they did it without charge accounts or credit cards. Property taxes took a few days' wages to pay. There was no income tax, no sales taxes, no luxury or excise taxes to any extent, only a tiny percentage of the citizens were employed in government, and government handouts to non-workers was practically unknown. Today, their grandchildren work at similar trades, but live in homes one-half to two-thirds the size of their grandparents. The wife works outside of the home. Often the children have part-time jobs, and they keep the number of their children down to one or two or three. And not only is their home smaller, but from 20% to 30% of their monthly income must go to pay the banker his tribute on their debt. And another 20% to 30% of their income goes to pay debts accrued against them by various agents of the government from local to federal. In that 75 years, American construction, American agriculture, and American factories have been motorized, electrified, and even computerized, increasing the worker's actual productive output to more than 20 times his grandfather's. But has the American worker's standard of living increased 20 times? No, it has not. What happened to that 20-fold increase in ability to produce? Why has not the farmer and the American worker benefited from machines, from electricity, and from computers? The answer is contained in one word, disobedience. Yes, disobedience to divine law, and especially in regard to usury, a five-letter word almost never mentioned from the pulpit today, usury, a word whose Bible meaning is robbery, somebody is robbing America. Our local newspaper revealed the assessed value of all land and improvements in America, now on the tax rolls, is about $1 trillion. But what they did not reveal 
was that we American citizens owe the moneylenders the equivalent of three trillions of dollars. Yes, three trillions of dollars. That is federal, state, local, and private debts on which we are paying them interest and through which they foreclose and take actual title on several tens of billions of dollars of other people's property every year. God said to our forefathers in Israel that if they disobeyed his laws, quote, The stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high, and thou shalt come down very low. He shall lend to thee, let me repeat that, he shall lend to thee, and thou shalt not lend to him. He shall be the head, and thou shalt be the tail. Deuteronomy 28, verses 43 and 44. In other words, one of the curses of God's law was for his people to be in debt to the stranger that is within thee. Any casual reading of the information about the men appointed by recent presidents to rule over the government bureaucracy will reveal that many, many of these men are alien-born, not born in the United States, but in Russia, in Poland, in Austria, in Germany, and so on. The stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high. Prophecy has come to pass. You should read, My Billions for the Bankers Brings War, Taxes, and Debts to the People. This is Pastor Sheldon Emery. We'll return to the Bible in just a few minutes, but first I will offer our free February literature for radio listeners. My address is America's Promise, Box 5334, Phoenix, Arizona, 85010. The February literature includes my illustrated booklet, which shows how the moneylenders... In America, we call them bankers, how the usury money lenders rob the American worker, farmer, and businessman of from 20% to 80% of all he produces. And they do it without a word of protest from the churches. The title of that booklet is Billions for the Bankers Brings War, Taxes, and Debts to the People. There are other items in the packet. The February packet of literature is free. Write to me at America's Promise, Box 5334, Phoenix, Arizona, 85010. I'll repeat the address at the end of the broadcast. Last week we read Jesus' words in Luke 19 to the wicked servant, where Jesus told the servant, Thou knewest I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest not thou my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury? That is verse 22 and 23 of Luke 19. And the clergy today teach that means that Jesus Christ approved of usury, or interest on money. But as I explained last week, it means the exact opposite. Jesus was saying to the man, in effect, You believed I took up where I laid not down, and reaped what I did not sow. In other words, you thought I was a thief, and stole that which did not belong to me. Then why didn't you collect interest on my money, and steal some more for me? Jesus was actually teaching that charging or taking usury or interest on money was exactly the same as stealing. So the clergy is lying when they say Jesus approved usury, and that lie is one of the most dastardly ever taught to a Christian people. For it is the usury credit system which is robbing and plundering America. By their false teaching on interest or usury, the ministers give approval to a system whereby the rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is the servant or the slave of the lender. Proverbs 22 and verse 7. Turn with me to the 28th chapter of Deuteronomy. This chapter and the 26th chapter of Leviticus 
are quite familiar to students of Bible law. Both chapters tell of great blessings which come from obedience to God's laws, and also of terrible calamities which come upon a nation for disobedience of those same laws. You should read all of both chapters, for you will see many of the troubles in America are listed under the curses. We have had the blessings as our forefathers obeyed the law. Now we are turning away from God's divine order and from His perfect laws, and we are beginning to suffer the consequences. But I want you to look particularly at just a few verses in Deuteronomy 28. Verse 1 through 14 are promises of blessings for obedience. Then verse 15, But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Then verse 16 through 19 are predictions of general trouble in home, farm, and family. Verse 21 and 22 predict great sicknesses upon the people. With 300,000 people dying in America every year of cancer, and that is only one disease, that has come to pass among us. Reading on in Deuteronomy 28, verse 25 and 26 tells of defeat in war, and America no longer wins her military battles. Verse 30 foretells increased infidelity and sexual perversion, and the following verses tell of property taken from the people and given to their enemies. Today they call it foreign aid, but it still is American wealth shipped to alien nations. A similar verse in Leviticus 26 reads this way, verse 16, And ye shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. You folks in Central America and in the plains of Canada grow millions of bushels of grain, which are shipped to and consumed in Red Russia, Red China, and Cuba by our enemies. Is it possible? God Almighty is sending that grain to our enemies to fulfill His word. More verses foretell of incurable diseases, the eating up of vineyards and production by locusts and worms. And I'll have some more to say on that later, God willing, because these locusts are identified by one of the other prophets as aliens, aliens allowed to come into Israel's land. And God alone knows how many aliens are now in America living on the U.S. taxpaying workers. They're called locusts in the Bible. But the verses I have been leading up to are verses 43 and 44. That is verse 43 and 44 of Deuteronomy 28. In case you aren't reading right along with me in the Bible, write these down and read them yourself, as soon as you can get hold of a Bible, verse 43 and verse 44 of Deuteronomy 28. If Israel disobeyed God's laws, this would happen, along with the other things we've just been talking about. Quote, the stranger, or the alien, the stranger that is within thee, shall get up above thee very high, and thou shalt come down very low. He shall lend to thee, and thou shalt not lend to him. In other words, you will be in debt to him. And remember, Solomon wrote, The borrower is servant to the lender. He shall lend to thee, and thou shalt not lend to him. He shall be the head, or the ruler. He shall be the head, and thou shalt be the tail, or the one ruled over. God was saying to Israel, You Israelites, if you turn away and break my laws, disobey my commandments I have given you, aliens, aliens will rule over you in debt bondage in your own land. Has it happened to America? How much debt do you think we must have before some of our people begin to wonder if the Bible has anything to say 
about America. Listen to this newspaper article. Here is a United Press International news article published in our Phoenix paper three weeks after the last presidential election. Headline, Federal Reserve Board Chairman Wales Power. The article is written by Mike Feinsilber, United Press International correspondent. He begins by telling how Chairman of the Federal Reserve Board testifies before congressional committees about Federal Reserve Board monetary policies. And then Feinsilber says this, quote, The Federal Reserve is able to nullify congressional and presidential attempts to alter the economy's course. The Federal Reserve can manipulate the money supply, the amount of money in currency and checking accounts. This influences interest rates, prices, employment, production, and construction. End of quote. Let me repeat that first sentence. The Federal Reserve is able to nullify congressional and presidential attempts to alter the economy's course. So who is the boss, ruler, dictator of America, if you please? Can it be the president, whom the people have voted for under the illusion that he will make the decisions and carry out the programs which will affect America's economy? No, obviously he cannot be the ruler if there is someone who has more power than the president and who has the control the people thought they had given to the president. Did Mike Feinsilber reveal who the real ruler of America is in that headline? Federal Reserve Board Chairman Wales Power? I think he did. How about another witness? Here is John Cunniff, or Cunniff, who is an economist so-called for Associated Press. Cunniff writes of the President's economic proposals and then says this, quote, Testifying before Congress, the Chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, which seeks to control money supply, both praised and damned the package, and nobody quite knows now if in practice he will support or oppose it. The chairman and his board can make their decisions largely in private. They do not have to comply with the president's wishes. They can choose their own course, end of quote. These two articles, and scores more could be cited, should prove to any thinking American that presidential elections are pretty much of a farce every two years. Americans vote to elect or defeat several hundred congressmen and one-third of the U.S. Senate. And every four years, thousands of people work for months for presidential candidates, millions of dollars are spent, and tens of thousands of articles are published about the intelligence, experience, morals, and motives of the candidates, and one is elected. And yet when the truth is out we find the elected one has no more control over the economy of the country than do the people who voted for him. The country is controlled and run by a small group of men who control the Federal Reserve Banks. And as I point out in my booklet, Billions for the Bankers brings war, taxes, and debts to the people. The so-called Federal Reserve Banks are not owned by the United States government. They are privately owned businesses in the business of creating debts for the nation and for the people, and their power is so great, the government itself must follow their dictates in all matters pertaining to the economy, money, and debt. In 1913, the United States federal debt was $2 billion, and all other debts in the nation were a few additional billions. In that year, the Federal Reserve System was formed, and the private bankers were given absolute control over the nation's money and debt. The federal income tax law was also passed in 1913. Now, less than two generations later, the federal debt is over $600 billion, and the interest paid to the bankers 
is over $4 billion per month. Yes, per month, not per year. Let me repeat that. The interest collected by these private bankers on the federal debt is twice as much every month as the entire federal debt was when they were given power to control our money. During the same time, private debt and the debts of other government agencies in city and state have reached upwards of two and one-half trillion dollars, from a few billion in 1913 to two and one-half trillion two generations later. I would say the bankers have done very well for themselves, managing our money and credit. Now holding either fee title or in debt bondage, every worker in the nation and every piece of property from the smallest home to the largest factory. They have created debts on the government, debts on which interest will be paid with the labor and property of our children and our children's children. And now we find admitted in the public press that which many of us have known for years, but which most Americans still do not understand, that these bankers can dictate to the President of the United States and to the Congress just what will be done in regard to the laws of the nation. What did God say would happen to our people if they turned away and disobeyed His laws? Disease, drought, defeat in war, immorality, destruction of the family, and the stranger that is within thee shall get up above thee very high, and thou shalt come down very low. He shall lend to thee, and thou shalt not lend to him. He shall be the head, and thou shalt be the tail." and he manages and controls the largest accumulation of liens and debts against any people which has ever been accrued in all of human history, the debts upon and against the American people and their nation. He is, with those around him in the Antichrist banking structure, without doubt, the actual dictator of the United States of America. In my booklet, Billions for the Bankers, which you will receive when you write for our free February literature, I quote part of a speech of a U.S. congressman of 40 years ago. He begins with these words, quote, Yes, you, the Federal Reserve Banking System, you are the dictator in our great nation. The rest of his statement you can read when you write for our February packet. But now let us turn to the basic cause of our troubles, our disobedience to God's law. We are in violation in many areas, but for now we will discuss God's laws on money and economics. In the Bible following the Ten Commandments, God gave Moses several hundred commandments, statutes, and judgments which make up God's laws for government and for the individuals. In Exodus 22, as God exhorted Israel about the personal relationship of people, he told them not to oppress any stranger or afflict any widow or fatherless child, verse 21 and 22, and then he speaks on lending money. This is Exodus 22. If thou lend money to any of my people that is poor by thee, thou shalt not be to him as an usurer, neither shalt thou lay upon him usury. Verse 25. This is expanded in Leviticus 25, verses 35 through 37. And if thy brother be waxen poor, and fallen in decay with or by thee, then shalt thou relieve or help him, yea, though he be a stranger or a sojourner, that he may live with thee. Take thou no usury of him, or increase, but fear thy God, that thy brother may live with thee, thou shalt not give him thy money upon usury, nor lend him thy victuals for increase. In Deuteronomy 23, God says he will bless them if they do not charge usury. Verse 19 and 20, Thou shalt not lend upon usury to thy brother usury of money, usury of victuals, usury of anything that is lent upon usury, unto a stranger, and that means an alien outside of the nation, unto a stranger thou mayest lend upon usury, 
but unto thy brother thou shalt not lend upon usury, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all that thou settest thine hand to in the land whither thou goest to possess it. That is a plain statement from God Almighty that it was necessary that his people refrain from charging interest on money, or else God could not bless them in their land. And by the way, the words usury and interest are interchangeable. The moneylenders and their cohorts in America, including those in the church, have taught us for a hundred years that usury is high or excessive interest. No, usury is interest. Interest is usury. God's law forbids usury on money, period. Prophecy is coming to pass right before our eyes. If we would only read God's word and seek the enlightenment of his eternal truth. God willing, in the next broadcast, we will get into the prophetic books of the Bible to show further why this great debt bondage and these calamities are coming upon us, and then we'll find from God's Word that the entire debt usury system of Babylon, which rules America,